My name is Kimberly Parker and welcome to Cup of VO, the podcast that brews up the perfect blend of knowledge, expertise, insights and anecdotes for all you voiceover professionals out there. Each week I'll invite you to step away from the booth to join me and some expert guests for a cuppa and a catch-up on a specific subject in the world of voiceover. I'm here to spill the tea on all those burning questions you've got about the voiceover industry and even the ones that no one dares to ask. Whether you're a beginner looking to break into the industry, an established pro, or simply curious to know more about what voiceover artists actually do, then this is the podcast for you. Together, we'll steep in some stories and stir up some inspiration to help you make the most of this incredible industry. It's time to grab your favourite mug, pop the kettle on, maybe bring a biscuit or two, and I'll be back in just a mo. I think it's just to do with the ear, you know, when you can hear things and you can replicate. Having a musical ear helps, I think. Right, shall we get started? My name is Kimberly Parker and I'm a full-time professional voiceover artist living in North London. Now, I've been wanting to launch a podcast for a while, as I've been asked a lot of questions by people already in the industry, whether that be other voiceover artists or audio professionals, such as creative directors and producers, who want to know more about a wide range of topics to do with voiceover acting. And while there are lots of resources out there, these questions often go unanswered. As an avid tea lover, what better way to do so than to create a series answering those questions and more in easy-to-digest episodes and all in the space of a tea break? For this first episode, I'm going to look at one of the most common questions I get asked, which is, how do I get into voiceover? I'm going to start my answer to this question the best way I know how, and that's to tell you how I did it, my origin story, if you will before I hand over to some of my fellow VOs on how they went about it. As a kid, I loved music, singing, dancing and making people laugh, which looking back was quite odd because I was also very shy. I would send tapes off to record companies, beg my parents to send me to drama school, spoiler alert, they didn't, and my most vivid memories of primary and secondary school were being constantly told off for talking in class. By the time I went to uni, I was auditioning for TV and talent shows, including Britain's Next Top Model, Shipwrecked and Hollyoaks, hoping to make a lasting impression. I then moved down to London and started working in marketing, before accidentally falling into social media roles. Within five years, I'd worked for several ad agencies and decided to go freelance and specialise in social media strategy. This was the first light bulb moment of my career. I knew that I loved working in a creative industry and that I got bored very quickly of working on one project or client for too long. You know those people who get asked in job interviews, why do you move around so much? Yeah, that's me. I hopped around from job to job every 18 months and I should have taken more notice then that perhaps I wasn't filling my creative cup enough with the work that I was doing. Things started to change when I went freelance. I did the classic thing of jump first, ask questions later. I had never run a business before or had any clue on how to do it. So in addition to trying to find freelance jobs, I was also learning the basics of setting up a company, getting a business bank account, getting insurance and all that exciting stuff. Once I was out there doing the work, I realised I was my own boss. I could choose which jobs I wanted to do, when I wanted to take a holiday and when I wanted to go and work with a completely different company. It was amazing. I spent the next six years building my business and client base. I got to travel, both with work and on holidays with my partner. Things were going great. But something was missing. I was always slightly jealous of people who knew what their calling was from a young age. How lucky they are that they figured it out young and didn't have to spend too much time with trial and error, all the while trying to put food on the table and all that grown-up stuff like saving for a mortgage or putting towards a pension. It wasn't until the ripe old age of 35 that a seed of an idea planted itself in my mind and very quickly began to grow. At that moment in time, I was newly married, we had a two and a half year old son and I knew that if I was going to make a drastic change to my life, now was the time to do it. I had a couple of friends that I'd been out of touch with for a while who were trained actors and also did voiceover on the side. After picking their brains and asking all sorts of questions, I was hooked. I found it so fascinating that people actually do this for a living. For the next few months, alongside my social media strategy business, I would frantically research everything I could about the world of voiceover. 
What does it entail? How do you get started? Is it possible to make a living from it? How do you find jobs? Where can you learn how to edit your own recordings? It was all encompassing and each time I learned something new, it made my passion and determination to enter the industry even stronger. I bit the bullet and found an experienced demo producer who gave me my first recording experience and some great tips on what to do next. And then I went out into the world with my professionally produced commercial demo and started to look for jobs. Within the first month, I had my first paid job for a major banking client through a friend of a friend who just so happened to be looking for a voiceover for a small online campaign with a quick turnaround. And luckily, they were willing to take a punt on me. After that first job was done, I was so excited that I decided that was that. I needed to make the leap over to voiceover. So after just a couple of months of dipping my toe into the voiceover industry, I told all of my social media strategy agencies and clients that I wasn't available for work and jumped headfirst into becoming a full-time VO. As you get older, you slowly start to realise personality traits that belong to you that can't be changed. One of my main ones is stubbornness. I'm a Taurus, what can I say? Some might perceive it as tenacity, but really, I just get an idea in my head and run with it. Looking back, I'm kind of glad that I didn't worry too much about how I was going to do it or what mountains I had to overcome to pull it off. I just started. Armed with what little knowledge I had of the industry, a childlike enthusiasm to learn more and, let's face it, a proverbial fire underneath me, financially speaking, as I'd very publicly given up all other avenues of income, so it kind of had to work. I started off small, looking at the genres that immediately stood out to me, commercial and corporate and hitting up existing contacts that might be able to help me either directly or by putting me in touch with colleagues or other friends that could. You don't know just how big your existing network of people really is until you start writing a list of everyone you're friends with, who they work for, everyone you've ever worked with, who your siblings or partner works with, and so on. I've now been doing this full-time for almost four years and it seems like it's just flown by. Looking back, it was perhaps one of the worst times in recent history to completely change careers with absolutely no experience. The bit where I mentioned I publicly renounced my old line of work? Yeah, that happened the same week as the first lockdown of COVID. Not great timing, I'll admit that. And I wasn't alone. In the months that followed, droves of actors who were no longer able to work in theatres or on TV or film productions due to the pandemic set their sights on voiceover as the perfect interim solution. So to say that the market was crowded when I started is a massive understatement. But the beauty of it was, it was a really weird time for everyone. And what you don't know can't really hurt you. I was not at all aware of how difficult it should be to find voiceover work or how many people I'd be up against when auditioning for projects. So, so ignorance was kind of bliss for me back then. As long as I was earning enough to pay my rent and feed my family, I was doing all right. You know that old adage about teaching a man to fish? Well, that's definitely true when it comes to giving advice about the voiceover industry, specifically on how to get started. There are so many different ways and the way one person does it might not be right for the next. There are no shortcuts. It's definitely not a get-rich-quick scheme or an overnight success story. The names you see winning awards and voices you recognise everywhere you go are killing it because they fought and worked hard to get there. My guests for this first episode are all voice actors that I've looked up to and have been inspired by since I started my VO journey. And I wanted to find out more about their lives before voiceover and how it helped them to get where they are now. Introducing, in order of appearance, Darren Altman, Claire Reeves, Ali Murphy and Alexia Kombu. I've included more information about all of them in the show notes, so be sure to check those out after the episode. I think it was the first time I got behind a mic in a voiceover setting and that was a class that I found on Mandy Actors Um, because I was was pursuing acting, um, screen acting, theatre acting and I came across this advert for a voiceover class Um, hadn't done voiceovers before, wasn't really sure what it really meant. So um, I went along, got behind the mic, was given a script and realised that this is what I have the passion for, Um, which came as a a huge surprise to me because I wasn't expecting that. 
that's when I realised, okay, there's something in this that, that's lighting a fire. I think I was at the point where I'd been auditioning for about a year um, for acting roles and I was doing lots of different part-time jobs at that point and I wasn't getting huge roles. The, the fire was starting to go out and that's how I knew that maybe it wasn't for me because for a lot of actors that doesn't phase them, it doesn't matter. They're willing to wait and I wasn't, which, you know, was a, a huge kind of crisis because all I ever wanted to do was act. So then finding this other kind of potential career where I'm still acting, just not having to learn scripts, not having to be in toxic audition rooms, the whole thing that comes with trying to get to where you want to be as an actor, theatre and screen, it was just removed from the voiceover industry. I think it was probably when I started thinking that I wanted to work in media and I probably didn't know what voiceover was as such, but I'd got an inkling that it was a thing. So I was a kid. I was probably about 10 and I thought, you know, I could do that talking on the telly thing and on the adverts. I think I used to sort of imitate them a bit. And I started working in radio um, very young. I think I did my school work experience in Radio Devon at 14 or something. And then just sort of talking on microphones became a thing. And radio was really my first love. And then sort of as a result of being in radio, I had to voice trails and things like that. And so I sort of was doing voiceover when I realised what it was. And it kind of became a thing more and more as people sort of started gradually asking me to voice things. Could you just read that stuff? Could you just do that? And, and I was like, oh, I appear to be doing voiceovers. <laughs> so it wasn't like a massively conscious I'm going to do this. It kind of grew from other things I was doing in radio and having an awareness that I was sort of all right with the sound of my own voice. It didn't bother me. I became highly critical and self directy I suppose, because I made myself listen to programmes I'd done, even on hospital radio. I'd made myself listen again and again and go, what, what worked, what didn't? So I became very conscious at sort of self-directing. Um, and I suppose voiceover kind of came from there for me. I play the baritone saxophone in my all-female saxophone quartet and being able to make a decent sound out of a massive saxophone really does help with breathing for VO. When you've got nowhere to breathe in that sentence, no one's going to give you anywhere to breathe in that sentence. You're in a live session and they just need you to get from one end of it to the other in one big breath, you know. <laughs> It's, it's useful for life as well because we, we needed to blow up a paddling pool and uh, we couldn't find the pump and there was a bit of a time pressure with my son having a party. So I was like, step aside, there's a baritone saxophone player in the house, you know, and I dealt with it. <laughs> it's a real life skill. <laughs> All the way through college, I've been doing impressions of of, of friends, and and uh, yeah, and it sort of one thing led to another, and I, I don't know why I was bored. I got this bit of software called Cool Edit, and I made a very very crude demo, and then started doing computer games and TV commercials, um, and it just sort of flowed from there. So then I not really even consciously sort of made a transition from being a, a full time gigging professional drummer to voiceovers so yeah I, th I think it's just to do with the ear you know when you can hear things and you can replicate having a musical ear helps I think I was a f I was a full-time professional drummer so I would you know play at Ronnie Scott's and record at Abbey Road like film soundtracks and TV programs and all that sort of stuff and tour I would do big bands and Latin gigs I, I am slash was a hypnotist. There was a group of us that used to go round um, London putting people into trance very quickly, a thing called speed trance, and I would stick their hands to tables and make them forget their name and put 50 quid in front of them and say, I'm going to count from 10 to 1, and if you can touch this, um, you can have the 50 quid. And they couldn't because they, their hands would shake. I first got into performing arts uh, when I was a kid and I was a child actor and did some TV and I did some ADR and, and stuff and I did love it 
back then, but that was like in the 90s. And then I took a massive long break. And um, so it's a bit of a funny story, actually. I, uh, I gained a load of weight and and I needed to lose it. So I joined Weight Watchers and um, other dieting programs are available. And, uh, and then I um, joined Weight Watchers and lost my weight, which was great. And then they were doing this thing where they were asking people, real people, to be a part of their commercial campaign and I applied because I used to be an actor and I missed it so I thought oh, that'd be fun and um, and I got it and um, part of it was a, a music video, part of it was like a commercial and lots of interviews and then they asked me to do some commercials and do some voiceover for it so I was in the studio doing voiceover for these Weight Watchers commercials uh, for free and um, they said, uh, when I came out I said oh god I just I love being behind the microphone that was just amazing do people do that as a job? And they were like, well, yeah, are you, are you not getting paid for this? I said, no. And they said, you, you know, you should be being paid thousands for this, right? And uh, and I thought, oh, maybe I should look into this. So I, I I started looking at courses in London and took some courses and I'm still working my day job at the time and just fell back in love with it. And that's what I always wanted to be. But I, I was told by people that it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a real career or, you know, I'd be risking losing everything if I gave up my day job. So I was kind of put off a little bit by doing that. But eventually redundancy was facing me and I and my now husband said to me, you know, if you could do anything, what would you do? And I said voiceover. And so he said, well, let's just make that happen. And that's, that's how I got into it. <laughs> It was such a blessing and like I realised how lucky I was because I with the redundancy money I had, I could invest it in, in training. So I just managed to do like a massive course on every single part of the business, which I think really just helped me become a full time voiceover re relatively really quickly, like within six months. So, yeah, I was very lucky. <laughs> I think the skills I gained from being a cabin crew member it's not something you'd really think about, but um, I learned to talk to absolutely anybody. On the plane, you just came across every single type of person, young, old, different cultures, different backgrounds, um, different life experiences. Uh, I'd often sit at the um, upper class bar and talk to passengers and just listen to their stories. And I think the skills I learned from that was to, to listen and, and also to be able to just be able to speak to anybody. That really helped with networking, which I think is such a key part of a successful career in any business is, is networking and you know just building relationships with people so weirdly that was probably the best skill plus I think I just I just gained a whole load of stories 14 years flying around the world different experiences different adventures some great some awful but it all just kind of rounded me out and gave me experiences that I can pull on um, especially in video games but even if I'm just doing like a lovely little corporate video, I can really picture who I'm speaking to because I have probably spoken to them at some point in my life. Reid Hoffman, the founder of LinkedIn, once famously said, if you're not embarrassed by the first version of your product, you've launched too late. And I think that also applies to making big decisions about your career. Just go for it. And like everyone else, you figure things out along the way. If you wait for everything to be perfect, you might never make the jump. I'm sure we've all listened back to old projects we've voiced and thought, ugh, could have done better on that, or, ugh, do I really sound like that? Maybe we don't even recognise ourselves. We all have to start sometime, so why not start today? If I was going to give three tips to newcomers looking to break into the industry, these are a pretty good one-size-fits-all. So no matter what genre you want to explore, or what your professional background is, these can work for you. Do your research. There are loads of websites and social media groups dedicated to sharing knowledge around all aspects of the industry, from training and equipment to technique and how to calculate rates. Test the water and get some training. Start auditioning for projects and treat each audition like it's the job. Invest in coaching and classes when and where you can. Anything that will make you more aware of your voice and how to use it, so performance, improv, singing, or specific voiceover training will help. Utilize your network for voiceover opportunities. As I talked about earlier, I had no idea how vast my network of contacts was until I wrote it all down. And it's like six degrees of separation. If you look hard enough, we can all trace our way back to Kevin Bacon. There will be someone in your network who knows someone who hires voiceover artists. I like to think that the litmus test of whether a person is cut out to make it in VO 
is whether they have the curiosity and determination to learn all about the industry themselves. Sure, we all ask questions and I have my go-to people for specific problems. But when you're just starting out, be an observer. Take it all in like a sponge and see how far your own passion will take you. Because no one has all the answers. Even experts with the best intentions will only be able to guide you on how they would tackle it. But they're not you. So you have to have the tenacity to carve out your own path. Join me same time next week when I'll be spilling the tea on demo reels. Without them, you're invisible. So I think preparing for any kind of demo is really important as well. They really do value the, the higher production over here. I mean, more and more you're getting asked to audition. Someone had an amazing showreel and they just, they just couldn't deliver in a live session. Thank you so much for joining me. If this episode has sparked any questions or comments or you just want to connect, you can find my email address and social handles at KimberlyParker.com. And please do follow and leave a review if you like what you've heard. You've been listening to Cup of Until next time, 